On September the 30th, the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo urged the Vatican to join the United States in denouncing violations of religious freedom in China, saying the Catholic Church should be at the forefront in the fight to insist on basic human rights there. Pompeo made the appeal at a conference on religious freedom organized by the US Embassy to the Holy See. It took place at the same time the Vatican is entering into delicate negotiations with Beijing on extending its controversial agreement over bishop nominations. Pompeo called on the Catholic Church to stand up for its followers who are oppressed for their beliefs by the communist regime in China. Pompeo said in his speech at the conference, Nowhere, however, nowhere is religious freedom under assault more than it is inside of China today. That's because, as with all communist regimes, the Chinese Communist Party deems itself the ultimate moral authority. Pompeo said the Chinese regime has desecrated and destroyed Catholic churches and shrines and imprisoned Catholic bishops, like Augustine Sui Te, priests and laity, including Catholic lay leaders in human rights movements in Hong Kong and other areas in China. Authorities order residents to replace pictures of Jesus with those of Chairman Mao, and those of General Secretary Xi Jinping. A textbook approved by the Chinese regime for usage in vocational training schools across China has altered a passage it quoted from the Bible. Because the mission of defending human dignity, and religious freedom in particular, remains at the core of American foreign policy. Pompeo added that although the United States has spoken for those oppressed, used various measures to punish those responsible for the abuses and urged others to join it in this advocacy, its efforts are constrained by the realities of world politics. However, the, the church is in a different position. Earthly consideration shouldn't discourage principled stances based on eternal truths. Citing the example of Father Bernhard Lichtenberg, a German priest who was imprisoned by Nazis and died in Gestapo custody for speaking out against the persecution of Jews by Nazis and helping the oppressed. Pompeo also reminded how Pope John Paul II played a pivotal role in igniting the revolution of conscience that brought down the Iron Curtain and challenged Latin American authoritarianism. I urge all faith leaders to exhibit a severely moral, bold witness for the sake of religious freedom, for human dignity, and for peace. Christian leaders have an obligation to speak up for their brothers and sisters in Iraq, in North Korea, and in Cuba. The Chinese Communist Party has battered every religious community in China. The Protestant house churches, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong devotees, and more. Nor, of course, have Catholics been spared this wave of repression. We must support those demanding freedom in our time, Pompeo said, citing St. John Paul II, retired Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis. Pompeo urged a greater commitment from faith leaders to stand up for all religious believers. Pompeo said, quoting Francis, To be a church permanently in a state of mission has, has many meanings. Surely one of them is to be a church permanently in defense of basic human rights, the Vatican's Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, also spoke in general terms about the Holy See's long-standing defense of religious liberty, but he didn't mention China or any country by name. Earlier this month, Pompeo published an essay in a Catholic magazine, First Things, that sharply criticized the Holy See's plans to renew a two-year-old agreement with Beijing and suggested that the Vatican had compromised its moral authority by signing the 2018 Accord with Beijing that allows the Chinese regime to appoint China's bishops. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is making another trip to Europe following Under Secretary of State Keith Crash push for the Clean Network program in Europe. Before the trip, he told the media that the U.S. had officially ended its policy of appeasement with the Chinese Communist Party and instead launched a crackdown strategy targeting it, including building a global alliance to counter the CCP. Pompeo visited a NATO base on the Greek island of Crete on September 29, expressing support from NATO allies for dialogue between Greece and Turkey to defuse regional tensions. Pompeo also warned that the CCP is trying to use economic power in the region to gain strategic influence over European democracies. Greece is seen as the bridgehead for the CCP's cooperation with European countries under its One Belt and One Road strategy. 
The Clean Network Program, on the other hand, was launched earlier by the United States. The program is aimed at sweeping away distrusted Chinese equipment and technology products in five areas, including telecom operators, mobile applications, app stores, network cloud services, and undersea cables, and calls on other countries to follow suit. Greece, due to its own economic problems, tend to be more pro-CCP on one belt and one road, which is what it's done in the past. Now Pompeo is welcoming Greece to the Clean Network Program through his speech. It means that Greece has to decide to be on the side of truth and justice at a critical historic moment with the United States. Under Secretary of State Keith Crouch is also in Europe now to promote the Clean Network Program. Pompeo's visit to Europe clearly has more to push for. Before his departure, he talked in an interview about the CCP's expansion in the Middle East and around the world. He elaborated on the U.S.'s decision to end the appeasement policy with the CCP and launch a crackdown strategy targeting it, including building a global alliance to counter the CCP. Describing this year as the first year of a new Cold War between China and the U.S., Xue Chi, a scholar on China issues, said the U.S. has always had an alliance strategy, and its progress depends on three factors. The first is that America's resolve is strong enough. Secondly, it depends on the continuation of the CCP's hardline policies. Then, the third factor, it depends on the Western countries' own choices of China policy. If policy wobbles like those in the European Union and Japan can be quickly adjusted, then the U.S. should be expected to make great strides in building anti-communist coalitions around the world. The attitude of Europe is now becoming clearer. According to information released by the State Department, Britain, Czech Republic, Poland, Swindon, Estonia, Romania, Denmark, Latvia, and other countries have all said they will not use products from untrusted suppliers on 5G networks. Leading telecom operators in France, India, Austria, South Korea, Japan, and the UK have all refused to use the tools of the CCP's surveillance system. Peter Bayer, the German Foreign Ministry's coordinator for transatlantic cooperation, said recently that whatever the final outcome of the U.S. election will be, Europe has got to stand shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. to face the huge challenge of China. The Japanese government is planning to call on the U.S., Germany, the U.K., and the Netherlands to work together on a new export control framework in four areas: artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, and hypersonic technology. Because once these technologies are exported to Chinese companies, they could be used for military purposes. At the behest of the Chinese authorities, the Five Eye Alliance, initiated by the U.S., works very closely together. And here comes Japan, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, India, plus the whole of the European Union. There was already an embryonic form for the formation of the entire World Alliance against the CCP. However, the CCP state media have described Pompeo's anti-communist alliance as an anti-China alliance. China's foreign ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin criticized Pompeo on September 29th, saying that day will not come. October 1st marks the 71st anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party's takeover of China, and at least 69 people have been arrested in Hong Kong as local police broke up scattered protests. Police made the first announcement of mass arrests at around 5:20 p.m. local time on its Facebook page, saying that at least 60 people were arrested in the Causeway Bay district for taking part in unauthorized assemblies. Among those arrested were two district councillors. The Hong Kong edition of the Epic Times identified the two arrested councillors as Li Yueshun and Fergus Liang. The police's second announcement came about an hour later. Announcing that a total of 69 people were arrested in Hong Kong on charges such as participating in unauthorized assemblies, possessing offensive weapons, and other allegations, Causeway Bay was the proposed starting point of a planned march organized by local pro-democracy group Civil Human Rights Front (CHRF). Police banned the march, arguing that mass gatherings of people during the pandemic could pose a grave threat to public health. As of September 30th. Hong Kong has a total of 5,088 COVID-19 cases. 
the city has seen a steady decline of infection cases since early September, registering 65 cases between September 17th and 23rd, and 38 cases from September 24th to 30th. COVID-19 is a disease caused by the Chinese Communist Party virus, commonly known as the novel coronavirus. CHRF initially organized the march to call for the release of 12 Hong Kongers currently being held in southern China's Shenzhen city. While traveling on a boat, they were intercepted and arrested by Chinese authorities off the coast of southern China's Guangdong province. Hong Kong media reported that they were sailing to Taiwan in a bid to obtain political asylum there. It is an annual tradition for Hong Kongers to protest Beijing's rule on October 1st, with activists noting that China's National Day is not a day of celebration, but a time to reflect on tragic events since the Communist Party seized power in mainland China in 1949, such as the Tiananmen Square massacre of student protesters in 1989. On the morning of October 1st, four members of the local party, League of Social Democrats, marched to Tsai Ying-pun, holding a banner with the words, There is no National Day celebration, only national mourning, and end one-party dictatorship. Large numbers of police officers began gathering in Causeway Bay before 2 p.m. local time, which was the proposed starting time of the CRHF march. Police searched pedestrians, pushed and shoved journalists covering the protests, and dispersed crowds, while repeatedly raising flags, warning people that they could be arrested for illegal gatherings or violating the newly implemented national security law. Beijing's national security law punishes vaguely defined crimes, such as secession and subversion with a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. The law went into effect late on June 30th, despite international concerns that the law would crush basic freedoms in Hong Kong. Despite the heavy police presence, Protesters shouted popular slogans, such as Five Demands Not One Less, and Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Time. On July 2nd, the Hong Kong government banned the latter protest slogan, saying it violated the security law due to its connotations of Hong Kong independence, or a Hong Kong that is separate from mainland China. Hong Kong, a former British colony, returned to Chinese rule in 1997. Beijing promised to retain the city's autonomy and freedoms, but international critics and locals say the security law has spelled the end for Hong Kong's liberties. A person dressed up as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, while holding a balloon in the shape of a missile, showed up in Causeway Bay to show support for protesters. The balloon was decorated with a piece of paper that read, expletive, the Communist Party. His presence drew applause from gathering protesters. The city has seen tumultuous protests against Beijing since millions took to the streets in June last year to oppose a since-scrapped extradition bill. But the pandemic, coupled with fears of arrest under the security law, have diminished protesters' presence. On September 29th, Hong Kong police announced on its Facebook page that 10,022 people have been arrested from the site of protests from June 9, 2019 to September 15th this year. Among those arrested, 2,227 have been charged for crimes such as rioting and illegal assembly. Chinese citizen journalist Zhang Zhan was arrested by Shanghai police in May this year for investigating and reporting the truth about the CCP virus pandemic. She is currently on a hunger strike at the Shanghai Pudong New Area Detention Center. People in China and abroad who are concerned about this case started an online petition calling on the CCP to release her. Zhang Zhan, a lawyer in Shanghai, was arrested by the police on May 14, 2020 for going to Wuhan to report on the CCP virus pandemic. On September 28, Zhang Zhan's attorney, Wen Yu, revealed the current situation of Zhang Zhan on WeChat moments. He said, Zhang Xuan is very thin and is still on a hunger strike. Two or three people in the same prison are responsible for feeding her liquid food. A person familiar with the matter revealed to a reporter of the Epic Times that the authorities warned Zhang Zhan's family members. Zhang Zhan is on a hunger strike and is unwilling to cooperate with the officials. The national security staff is very annoyed. The insider also revealed that Zhang Zhan still believes that she has done nothing wrong. She insists on pleading not guilty because reporting the situation in Wuhan on the internet is exercising her right of freedom of speech. This year, she went to Wuhan for field interviews, just walking and looking around. 
She said what she wanted to say and then recorded a few videos. She has a Twitter account and she uploaded her videos there. The authorities arrested her just because of that. We still hope you can report more about Zhang Zhan because she will be facing a court opening in October. Zhang Zhan has been on a hunger strike for more than a month. Several people in the same prison force-fed her. They inserted a tube from her nose to feed her something because she didn't eat. On September 20th, the Chinese Human Rights Lawyers Group issued a statement stating that all words and deeds of Zhang Zhan are not illegal or criminal. Her arrest by the police and her prosecution are totally illegal and political persecution. The statement said that nothing she had done in Wuhan had broken any Chinese law, and that Zhang had merely been exercising her constitutional rights. She should be declared innocent and released immediately. China has no freedom of speech. Under the ruling of the Communist Party, there cannot be any doubts or different voices in China. Zhang Zhen's trip to Wuhan prompted her to voice differently from that of the CCP. Of course, the CCP does not want to hear that. Many people in China and abroad have signed the petition on change.org, demanding the acquittal of Zhang Zhan. Mr. Gao, a Wuhan resident, said, She's not doing well right now. She may die in jail because of the hunger strike. She could hardly survive, but she is only in her 30s. The Chinese Communist Party has the final say. They can arrest whoever they want to arrest and charge you with whatever crime they want to charge. Not only her, but each of us can be arrested at well. No reason is needed. Ren Zigan was sentenced to 18 years. Will CCP care about her? She is not guilty. She should be released immediately. What crime did she commit? Reporting the lives of ordinary people truthfully, is this a crime? Wang Jianhong, one of the initiators of the petition, told Radio Free Asia that Zhang Zhan's remarks on the internet platform truthfully tell what she has seen and heard in Wuhan, expressing her thoughts and opinions on China's current and future situation and her deep compassion for the suffering of our compatriots. She just uttered what a conscientious Chinese wanted to say. By the time NTD reporters published the article, more than 500 people had signed the petition online, demanding the CCP release Zhang Zhan. Wang Tianhong hopes that Zhang Zhan's courage and responsibility can inspire more Chinese people to wake up, dare to speak the truth, and act to change China. This is also the best support for Zhang Zhan. The CCP has the final say of everything. If the party says you broke the law, you broke the law. If the party says you didn't break the law, then you didn't. If the party says you are corrupt, you are corrupt even if you aren't. This is how a totalitarian society is. It's like a meat grinder, and it will finally ring itself in. It's not a normal society, and there's no justice. It's coming. The day is about to dawn. The crazier it is, the sooner they get toward the end. It has lied for more than 70 years. If you tell the truth, doesn't that kill it? Let's see how long they can go on. It's already the beginning of autumn. Let's see how long they can make it. Before Zhang Zhan was arrested, three other citizen journalists, Fang Bin, Chen Qiu Shi, and Li Zihua, were also arrested by the CCP for reporting the truth about the epidemic and sharing videos in China to the world.